Alrighty, uh, I've got a lot of content. Uh, I thought I had an extra hour to cut content, but uh, ironically, as in preparing a mistake proofing talk, I was using my computer's clock to know when I needed to get over here, and it was on Central Time. So, <laughs> so that's the beginning. So, uh, uh, so hello, my name is Brian Hunter. I'm an enterprise fellow at HCA Healthcare. Uh, I've been getting paid to write software since 1994. And so most of my career up until uh, since I've been at HCA uh, building water park was in consulting. And so I have seen, I've worked for hundreds of clients over the years and I've seen a lot of sad, tragic software. I've, I've seen how software can live on as this undying misery machine, this hurt bot that's out there just punishing people long after the original developers have moved on. And so these uh, experiences have taught me that empathy should be the core skill for programmers. Don't hurt others, help others. Help others to not hurt others. All right, uh, we begin with pokoyoke, which is a Japanese term, uh, largely used, uh, used in Japanese manufacturing, uh, but it means mistake-proofing or error prevention. Uh, Pokeyoke can be described as a forcing function or uh, behavior-shaping constraint. Uh, and um, here we have in the wild a, um, uh, a Pokeyoke. So, we have this underground parking garage, and I'm curious, could the lights uh, maybe go down just a tad? It is so early in the morning, I don't think anyone's gonna fall asleep now, and then it'll help us with the, okay, thank you. Um, okay, cool, cool. Uh, so uh, we have this underground parking garage, and a vehicle taller than seven feet driving in here uh, is gonna bump into this plastic bar that's dangling from the chain, and they're gonna know not to enter. And uh, so this, with this simple, cheap pokoyoke, the designer has prevented just countless costly mistakes. You think about the alternative, if instead the designer had only stenciled in and painted, uh, you know, seven feet clearance, well, anyone that didn't know the exact height of their vehicle or was busy looking for change to pay the, you know, the their car to pay the attendant or whatever at the bottom, you know, they're going to be distracted. They might enter and they're going to cause a lot of damage. And so, it would be a miserable day for everyone involved in this. And so the observers that saw this, they would be talking about this idiot driver, this stupid driver that did this stupid thing, and they'd be laughing about it or whatever, and the world would become a little worse and a little meaner. And so here's another common pokey, okay? So manhole covers, they're typically round. So if there's a storm uh, comes through and, and uh, 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 a stormwater lifts the lid, it's likely to spin around a little bit and then settle right back down in the same spot. And it's not going to leave a hole so you can, you know, fall down into it or, you know, car cause accidents. And, uh, and even, uh, so it's also a shape of, you know, it's this shape of constant diameter or a curve of constant width so that, uh, so if uh, the, the worker lifts this thing up on its edge as they're doing something, it can't possibly fall down the hole. Uh, no matter which way they turn it, it's not going to fall down the hall. And so there's a pokey okay that we see every day. <coughs> okay, so here we have <coughs> two covers, a circle and a rolu triangle. Both are curves of constant width, and neither can fall down the, the manhole. And so you can find uh, rolu triangle manholes in parts of San Francisco. So why is that? So San Francisco is really hilly, and if a worker lifts this manhole cover up and it accidentally starts rolling off, it's going to wobble and fall over instead of flying down Lombardo Street and killing 100 people and then flying into the bay. So it's a double pokeyoke. So it's like a, this, uh, it's not cool. So a goal for this talk will begin, uh, that, that you all begin looking for pokeyokes in the wild. Um, and so... Uh, my kids made the Pocoyoke uh, Poco Go joke off of this, but so, um, uh, so I'd like it to become your new weird sport. And uh, I, a friend of mine sent me this picture, I think this is a quaffle, or maybe a, a, a bludger or a snitch, I'm not sure which one that is. Uh, uh, okay. okay, so these two characters here, 
Uh, we're going to jump into Japanese manufacturing, and Shigeo Shingo and Taichi Ono were key figures in the Toyota production system. And these three excellent books, I, I actually have them here, <coughs> uh, if anyone wants to take a peek later. Uh, so if you've enjoyed, uh, read enjoyed the Toyota way, uh, this book here is the, what things are based on. This is the, the real meat, and then you've got the business book built up on top of it, which is excellent, but this is the, the raw good stuff. And um, <coughs> so uh, from it, there's an excerpt. Uh, so on seeing this worker just watching a machine in an American plant, uh, I says, I could not believe the waste and lack of respect management had for that human being. All he did was watch the dials, waiting for the glass to break or be out of tolerance. So having that human chained to and serving a machine, just, it felt depraved. You know, it was just wrong to have a human, um, you know, subservient to the machine like that. And I think about our tools <laughs> and what we do all day long. We think we got it pretty good, but a lot of times we're watching the machine. And so <clears throat> there's something sort of sick about that, and we should, we should take notice, I think. And so uh, if we respect the humanity of others and use empathy, we can do better than this. And so question, are errors unavoidable? So we could say, okay, errors are unavoidable. People make mistakes, blame them. Uh, detect mistakes in final inspection or let the customers find the mistakes. <clears throat> and so uh, as awful as this is, there are a lot of companies that actually go down this route and this is the way they operate. But uh, let's not be that cynical. Let's, let's look for a better world. <clears throat> let's say that errors are avoidable and any mistakes that people make can be reduced or eliminated and we're gonna train people to build better systems on prevention. So, pokey okays prevent mistakes. So let's, let's, that's one of our territories where we can look at. <clears throat> so the idea behind a pokey okay is to respect the intelligence of workers. So if we look at these repetitive tasks or actions that depend on vigilance and memory, if we put in a pokey okay or different devices that can free a worker's time and their mind to, to focus on more creative value adding things, then we have won. So a uh, couple of functions of uh, pokey okay. Uh, prediction. So we can recognize the defect is about to occur and then shut down, do flow control, or have a warning. Or we can have detection, which is going to recognize that it's already occurred, and we're going to then perform shut down, flow control, or warning. And so how these tie in in this flow, so if we have a prevention pokey okay, it's going to take uh, a process and it's going to keep a mistake from happening. And the detection one is going to, okay, well, mistake happened, but we're going to keep that mistake from turning into a defect. So let's get a concrete example of what one of these looks like uh, outside of manhole covers and uh, parking garages. <coughs> so here we have a steel plate that has this big hole in the bottom left, and we know that we're supposed to drill a hole exactly in this spot at the top right. <coughs> so if we do it correctly, it's like this. And so, not, not so bad, not so hard, but what happens if the plate comes to us like this? You know, we, we're getting plates all day long and we, maybe we get a plate flipped around like this. If we do this and drill the hole there, we have a defect. This part is bad and we maybe wouldn't even notice it. It would go on down, it'd be used by others. And so you can think about this happening in our software as well. So all these things, I mean, we're talking about manufacturing here, but everything is easily translatable. Um, so we, we had it backwards. So how could we fix that? So here's a pokey okay. Uh, it's basically a jig, this a guide pin and jig here, so that if uh, a piece comes down and lands on it, it'll seat neatly. And when it seats neatly like this, the guide pins go down, everything is seated, you can tell it's right, and then also uh, the drill will activate. But if a piece comes in wrong, comes in like this, it's gonna flop down and it won't be able to sit down on top of that guide pin, it won't look right, but then two, it won't be able to make electrical contact and so the drill won't even allow the hole to be drilled. In that. And so, so if we get this guide, it's gonna keep this awful thing from happening. And so this is what a worksheet would look like for a poke yoke. Uh, so it describes the process uh, of the mistake proofing device that we, this one is actually for the, what we just introduced with that plate of steel coming down in the drilling. And so uh, this is a full workout of, of that. We see the process, the problem, the goals, the mechanism, and the resulting improvements. Up in the top, you can see it's to prevent the error, it can detect the error, it's gonna shut down, yes, control, and so, on, and so on. And then we see the before the improvement and after the improvement. And you can use this exactly as this in your software projects. 
and it can, you can use this to drive your continuous improvement. <coughs> so requiring diligence is cruel because it guarantees that someone is going to fail in the future. In 1997, uh, landmines were outlawed by the UN. And um, I think we have this problem in software right now where there's a whole part of the industry that's out there teaching people how to navigate the minefield. And instead of getting rid of the minefields or teaching people to stay out of the minefields. And um, I, I believe one of the best ways of getting out of the minefield is moving into functional programming. And so uh, I think we should destroy and rebuild the systems that require diligence. So here are the five best pokey okay. So guide pins of different sizes, error detection and alarms, limit switches, counters, and this one went red because there are four here and there's a total of five over here. So we have this counter that just saved us and then we have checklists. And uh, this is a book, I th I, everyone in the room would get something great out of this. The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. Uh, and so he goes in with all these amazing stories about, uh, about how checklists are used in aviation and that's why we don't die every other time we get into a plane. And uh, it's amazing how effective these checklists are and how they, uh, uh, you know, how the operators of planes use these. And it was so effective that it got ported over into healthcare. And so doctors follow checklists in the same way that pilots and co-pilots do. And, um, and so then medicine became safer. And so we can have uh, checklists in our software. I mentioned last year in the water park talk, uh, about a checklist, we, we use checklists throughout Waterpark, but in particular in the alerts. We, we know as we're going through and generating alerts, uh, check, 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 and then the thing happens. And we, we don't move until the check is there. So we're not having to actually determine a, with a bunch of complex logic, we just basically check boxes. Much easier, much easier for people to reason about. And so, um, yeah, so in code you can build like a series of just plain English questions and those plain English questions, uh, you know, just a phrase there, uh, can have the check beside it, and then you can move the complexity behind pure functions then. <coughs> so it's fun to think about how these will translate to code, but uh, pokey okay hints. Identify items by their characteristics, weight, dimension, shape. Maybe is that pattern matching type systems? So detect a deviation from procedures or committed processes, and detect deviation from fixed values via detection devices. <coughs> so here, <coughs> we have uh, 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 just a page right out of the book. I think this one's really fun. And so we have these situations at the top uh, of uh, do we allow a defect to leave the company? Uh, we don't let it leave the company. We uh, decrease the defects. We, uh, defects do not leave the local process or the local team. You know, maybe they move around the company, but they don't leave the doors of the company. And then we have uh, zero defects. And so we get there with different processes. And so over here, we see um, operations, uh, we have errors, defects, and they go straight out the door. And this is, uh, you know, a company can operate the, like this up until they go out of business. And uh, over here, and so this might be, so uh, funny enough, since we're these lean concepts here, probably the companies that work like this more than anyone are the companies that call themselves lean startups. But, uh, it's, you know, this is amazing, but anyway. Um, but so uh, over here we have <coughs> defects do not leave the company. And so in this case, uh, we have inspections at the, after the defects are there, and so we just don't allow it to leave the door. We still have the, all the cost and all the waste and all, all of that, but we at least don't uh, lose customers because of defects. Unless we might lose customers because we're slow, because we made a bunch of garbage and we couldn't ship it. But, but so, um, and so that sounds a lot like software companies there. <coughs> and so uh, in here, we, uh, what we do is we go to, uh, at least after the inspections, we have a process where we're uh, looking and reviewing and trying to improve our process. So we're going to have fewer defects probably. And then over here, we do this in a local cell so that it only goes within a small part of the company, one team, and then it, we don't even affect the rest of our own company. And then finally, we introduce Pokeyokes over here where, we're, uh, where, the, um, where we have the operations going down to errors, but our inspection is basically done as a Pokeyoke. It basically catches the thing and it doesn't even become a defect. And so 
we've got this, and then we can improve the pokey okay each time that this happens. And so I think this is a really fun one. <coughs> Our next book uh, that we're going to look at here is, is here, if anyone wants to take a peek at this later, by Nancy Levison. And it's on stamp. <coughs> So Engineering a Safer World by Nancy Levison, uh, safety researcher at MIT. The book introduces this accident causality model called STAMP or Systems Theoretic Accident Model and Processes. So that's a mouthful, so that's why it's called STAMP. And then STPA, which is also a mouthful. Uh, but, uh, but it's a hazard analysis technique that's based on STAMP, and these go hand in glove. And both of these are uh, built up on top of systems theory. And so systems theory. So this is the study of systems, which is not a big surprise, but or the study of cohesive groups of interrelated, interdependent components. And so systems, they have boundaries, and they operate within a context, and they're expressed through their interactions with other systems. And so this, this idea was cooked up in the 50s uh, simultaneously uh, by biologists and engineers. Uh, they're just working you know, separately, but I think that's cool. Uh, so systems theory uh, it, it have, uh, is more than the sum of the parts when it expresses emergent behavior. And so systems, they can have emergent behavior. So if you looked at an individual cell and you paid attention in biology class, you might be able to identify that it's a plant cell. But could you determine that a bunch of these cells would make an apple? Maybe, I don't know. I, 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 I know I couldn't, uh, but so uh, I don't know if someone could. Uh, and so how about would it be, um, how big would the apple be? Or what the shape of the apple be? You know, you, you couldn't probably get that out of looking at an individual cell. And how about if it would be a yummy apple? Yeah, so, so these are properties that don't have meaning at the cellular level. They emerge from an organized complexity of the system. And so we have lots of things that emerge inside of software. <clears throat> so we, we have here, I think this is, I, I love this, this diagram. So on, on the left, on the y-axis we have degrees of randomness, and on the x-axis we have degrees of complexity. And we have these bars, and we spend our time down here a lot of times, well, the last hundreds of years we spend our, uh, our time down here in this box, and this is where most of us are comfortable day by day, in this land of organized simplicity. And so here we can divide and conquer. We can use analytic reduction. We can say, okay, I've got a problem, and it's a hard problem. I'm going to break it in half, and I'll have two smaller problems, and I'll be able to solve this one. And then, uh, and if it's too, the other one's too hard, I'll break it down. And you keep on breaking and breaking and breaking. And uh, that works uh, if you're dealing with something that is not a complex system. And uh, it, you know, great success here. And this is you know, how we debug and how we do a lot of things, unless you're working in a very complex system, and you might not find the bug. So we have this other bar over here where we have uh, unorganized complexity. And so this is where stats come in. You know, so our statisticians, our data scientists live up here above the bar. So what about this gap over here? I mean, what do we do there? And this is where we are since 1980 with software. Uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, software got, gets, you know, software is complex and it builds and, and you have infinite complexity as you have more and more systems hooking in together. And so, this is where we find ourselves, and so systems theory is our solution. So complex systems that exhibit emergent behavior, and sometimes this behavior isn't yummy like the apple. Uh, it, emergent behavior can lead to crashing failures even when every component in that system is reliable and is working as designed. The interaction is where the problem is. So STAMP and STPA concentrate on um, they concentrate on organized complexity area of the diagram and focus on eliminating accidents and identifying system hazards. And so we have uh, accidents, which is any ex unacceptable loss. You know, so people die, you know, we have a huge environmental disaster, um, and so on. And so, uh, and accidents can be caused by things outside of your system. They can be caused by the environment. And a system hazard, we'll define this term as being um, a system state or a set of conditions that together with a particular set of worst case environment conditions will lead to an accident or a loss. And a hazard is something that we can control in the design. And so we can keep hazards from, um, uh, we can control our hazards and keep then accidents from happening. 
So STAMP incorporates these three components of constraints, hierarchical level control, and process model control loops. The STAMP accidents are examined by why the controls are in place, uh, why the controls that are in place fail to prevent the hazards, and why these controls fail to enforce the safety constraints of the system. So constraints, uh, it's this basic concept in, uh, in STAMP, and not events. We don't worry about events or uh, the series of events that led from a root cause because STAMP basically doesn't, uh, STAMP basically says that root cause analysis is, is garbage. It's, it's bogus, it's, uh, there's nothing to it, and it ends up just use it being a, a way of, uh, of moving the, the, the eye of attention from a, po a powerful interest to the line worker at the end so you can cast blame. And so root cause analysis is just uh, is, is rubbish according to STAMP. And so instead of that, it's a uh, resulting from the interaction among components that violate system safety constraints. So our hierarchical level of control. So we have these control structures at each level that impose constraints on the activities uh, on the level below it in this interaction. And constraints or lack of constraints allow or control lower level behavior. So here <laughs> we have an individual component that may seem like a wild out of control fire, but given a well-defined constraint at a higher level, <laughs> everything can be safe, nominal, and yummy. And so, so let's, uh, we'll move on. It's common to confuse safety with reliability. So context determines if software is safe. It's not possible to look at a software alone and determine safety. Software is not really safe or unsafe, but it can contribute to unsafe behavior, um, including unsafe human behavior. And so we see this graph here where a lot of times we mix these two together, but we can have uh, a completely dodgy, unsafe thing that is totally reliable, and then we can have something that's unreliable but is never gonna, uh, gonna cause a loss. And we have this awful spot in the middle uh, where <laughs> I think a lot of software probably lives, but, uh, um, but uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, process models. Controllers, uh, human or automated. And so this is a really interesting thing, is every time we talk about controllers in this, it can be a system, it can be software, it can be some mechanical system, or it can be a human. And STAMP doesn't really differentiate between people and, and, and software. Uh, but uh, so uh, when controllers, they have this mental model. Uh, I guess a mental model if you're software. But anyway, it, uh, this mental model of a system being controlled. And accidents happen when the controller's mental model differs or is inconsistent with the actual process's state. And so... Um, <laughs> I like this quote by George Box. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So this is PowerPoint animation. <laughs> so uh, here's a control system that operates through actions and feedback. And so we just see uh, the controller kicking out actions, the control process down here. We got uh, measured variables coming back up, the sensors. And so the car is either slowing down or speeding up. Whether this is a human or autonomous, you know, it doesn't matter in, in Stamp's view. They're the same. And so, um, STAMP creates safety by controlling hazards. Once a hazard is identified, you use STAMP to generate safety controls to prevent um, uh, basically the problems. And so, uh, that was a, what we're looking at here is a closed system modeled under STAMP, and here is an open system modeled by STAMP. And you can see the big difference is we have inputs coming in from uh, right over here, uh, process inputs. And so these process inputs are coming in from other controllers or from other systems. And we have process outputs going out to other, uh, uh, to other systems. And at the bottom, we have disturbances, like just weird stuff happened, you know, like the environment happened. And so we have our disturbances coming in, and uh, our vehicle looks like it's handling it all right. So uh, good, good job, designers. And so, um, so STAMP provides a classification of control flaws leading to hazards. And so we're going to see this big word soup here. Uh, and so it might be good to take a picture because we won't be able to spend a lot of time on this. But uh, uh, provides a classification of control flaws leading to hazards. And so this collection of these control flaws can be seen as a checklist uh, of the areas that we need to audit and ensure uh, constraints are in place. And so we'll go across from, uh, so our input itself could be wrong. 
<laughs> so what we've told the control, the, what the controller is told to do is wrong. To, to what it's told to control is wrong. We could have in, uh, inadequate control algorithms. We could have inappropriate and ineffective control actions, inadequate operations uh, at the actuator. And we could have uh, conflicting control actions coming in from these other controllers. And the input could be wrong or missing. Uh, we can have delayed operations. We can have these unidentified or out of range uh, disturbances like our uh, UFO. Uh, changes over time. And so we can have drift, environmental drift. Our software can change. It can not match up with what the rest of the world looks like. Uh, maybe it doesn't match up with what the controller is expecting. We have dry rot basically in software. <coughs> uh, we could have an actual component failure, feedback delays, process output, measurement inaccuracy, and, and so each one, click, 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 these are the places where we're going to have our checklist and we're going to go through our fault analysis and we're going to look for hazards within that. And so, um, as I said, rubbish, it creates illusion of control and it only results in fixing system, sy symptoms instead of systems. Uh, but um, this is, uh, I think, the key takeaway for the stamp part of this. And so safety comes from proper system design. Operator error is a symptom, not a cause. And human error is never the explanation for accidents. So never blame the human. It's never the answer. The problem is always when a hazard isn't controlled by the system design, <coughs> which lines up with, who is, who's read this book? I'm curious. Uh, yeah, so I, I know there'd be some folks. So uh, this, this, the philosophy is here across the Pokioke, across the stamp, and across uh, Donald Norman's uh, design of everyday things. Most accidents are attributed to human error, but in almost all cases, human error was the direct result of poor design. Good design can prevent slips and mistakes. Design can save lives. <coughs> so in software, in our next few minutes, <laughs> ah, uh, um, so uh, we have bugs, so flaws in the system are a component that can lead to failure. And we have a few different kinds of errors that can happen. And so compile time errors, these are the cheapest. You know, we get them all day, we're like, ah, rats. But that's actually where we really want to see them. We really want to see them as compile time errors. Uh, runtime errors, much worse, there's some pain here. Logic errors are evil. And so they can hurt you without you even knowing it for years. And then the design errors earlier, or missing designs, they can make the world mean and cold and uh, they're like empathy vampires. And so those are the worst of all. <clears throat> and no one even recognizes them as being errors. So I'd argue that the greatest source of bugs and hazards in software uh, is object-oriented programming. And so this, uh, this wrestling match, the churn, this continuous change without improvement, <laughs> We're all, you know, I spent way too much of my life uh, out hacking at the branches of evil and not at the root. And so, thankfully, I bumped into Erlang, and so I moved. Uh, so now I'm, I'm hacking at the root of evil. Uh, uh, with, you know, it gave me the power to see that. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, this is a disaster land. And even Alan Kay agrees. So, uh, oop. Um, so. You have 15 more minutes. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Okay, so he invented OO. And uh, he says, I can tell you I didn't have C++, plus, C++ in mind. But he also described OOP as being uh, messaging, local retention, and protection of hiding state processes, and extreme late binding of all things. And I hear that, and I don't think Java, and I don't think C Sharp, I think Erlang. You know, th that's, he's basically describing Erlang there. <coughs> so we'll see some Erlang here. So immutability. So we'll look at our uh, FP pokeyokes and mistake-proofing devices. And so in CompSci 101, we see this, x equal x plus 1, and the answer to that, oh, it's increment, yay. And over here, in high school math class, you see this, and that is an F in summer school. <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll see what Erlang thinks about it. <laughs> and so, uh, so uh, here we go, x equal 5 says five, we'll say x equal x plus one, and it says exception. And so it says the right-hand side doesn't match the value six. This is crazy, it's, it's, this is untrue. You get an F and go to summer school. Okay. So a thought experiment, imagine a world where stealing things isn't just illegal, but it's actually 
impossible. It violates the laws of physics. You can't steal in this, in this universe. And so you'd live your life differently. You'd, you, know, you could go to the restroom at a coffee shop. You'd leave your laptop there. You wouldn't worry about it getting stolen. And uh, you wouldn't lose your car keys because you wouldn't have car keys because your car wouldn't have locks on it because you wouldn't have to worry about that. So all these... All of these things go away. You'd be able to leave your kids uh, at, the, at the park. You wouldn't worry about someone stealing your kids. And, and so all these things, the world would be better if it couldn't happen. But just, and, and so most people aren't car thieves or, or kidnappers, but we have to live like everyone is a, is a car thief. Uh, you're acting like you're in Grand Theft Auto uh, every time you get into your car. And it's, the world isn't like that, but since it's possible, everyone has to change their behavior. And this is what happens in languages that don't have mutability, immutability. And this is what happens in languages that don't have constraints. This is what happens in Java. This is what happens in C++ and in C Sharp. So when you're in a world, though, where the, the, the compiler knows not, it, nothing's going to, you can't do this thing. The compiler can know about that, and it can take all these advantages. And, uh, and it can optimize around the fact that not only do I have to not worry if this person's doing it, they can't do it. <laughs> All right, purity. <clears throat> A goes to B. So a uh, pure function, you have an argument that comes in, you know what's going to come back out. Uh, there's no state and environment. And anyone that's interested in talking about the Erlang VM and purity with me, I have some stories that might surprise you. I, I'll argue that the Erlang VM is a pure, the Erlang and Elixir are pure functional languages. And, uh, but I don't have time to do that right now. <laughs> so, uh, so the problem with OO, so this is a quote from Joe Armstrong I really love. He says, the problem with OO is you ask OO for a banana, and instead you get the gorilla holding the banana and the whole jungle. And so OO, every time you reach your hand in for the banana, you call, every method call, you stick your arm in there, and you might get it yanked off. Because, you know, like, what properties have already been set before I call this method? Uh, what was passed in on the constructor of this class before I called the method? Is someone else calling this method on another thread right now? So, so many scary things can go wrong that it's just, you're, you're never, you're never going to work your way out of it until you basically contort OO to look pure static, you know, have static functions with read-only properties. And it's basically, you have OO, I mean, you have FP, it, it, like, cobbled on top of something where you don't have the guarantees. And so, the problem with this is it requires diligence. And what do we think about the people that require diligence? You know, we, we don't like those people, right? And so we don't like, uh, yeah, so let's stay away from that. And um, as we move towards uh, uh, FP from OO, we improve correctness and we increase stability and uh, we can improve on top of this. And so one nice thing about the pure functions or about functions uh, where you, you're, you're guaranteed to have this flow is you get to use nice things like this. Piping forward. Not telling you anything you don't know, everyone in this room. I'm just, uh, we're all just going to get to celebrate. Uh, so instead of doing this, which you don't know what's happening with that taco down there, you're not sure quite what it's even for, uh, we get this, and it's very clear. And so it becomes readable as a result of this. Union types. So we get to see some gleam code here. So uh, we have a discriminated union here where we have this type that has a circle, a square, a triangle, a rectangle. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to define a function called get area, which takes a circle, a square, a triangle, a rectangle, and then calculates the area off of it. Okay. If we add an ellipse up here to our shape and then try to compile, it's going to bark and say inexhaustive pattern. And so this is a checklist. So we've defined our type, and every place we have functions using this, if we haven't exhaustively handled all the cases, we're going to get an error. And it's going to keep us from making these terrible mistakes that would become runtime errors. One null. And so uh, Tony Hoare calls it his billion dollar mistake. And so it was really around, uh, so he wanted to have this safe language. He wanted to be good and he had the safe language, but he got tempted. And he put in null reference because it was just so easy to implement. And as a result of it, we've had system crashes and just pain and damage for 40 years. Uh, you know, and this guy feels awful about this. You know, a guy gets, you know, Sir Tony Hoare here. Uh, he's done awesome things in computer science, but you know, this is, you know, this is a thing he has to, you know, deal with. And so that's awful. Uh, um, 
So there was no pokeyoke there with the with the null. But but we have it in Gleam. So <coughs> here, if we say get area and we pass a nil, you don't get the same thing you would in Java or C sharp. You don't get a null reference exception. You get a uh, at runtime instead. You're going to get a compile error that says, oh, no, uh, that's not of the same type as shape. And it's going to keep you from having the problem at compile time. And so this is a phrase, uh, Yarin Minsky's phrase uh, that gets used a lot in, um, in um, you know, the talk conferences where you have a lot of people with talk, top, uh, type system talks and Henley Milner uh, types, you'll have uh, this, this quoted, make illegal states unrepresentable, which is the same thing that we're talking about with the pokey okay and the stamp and so on. <coughs> so. Incorrect docs. Uh, this is a funny one from MSDN where <coughs> they, in the doc, they actually show an example of, the, of a different function than what it says it's supposed to be. They're supposed to do is, but they're doing as, which is a <laughs> just a complete goof up. And in the middle of it, there's this bug here of where they actually use the O instead of the E. And so they have a bug in here that would uh, lead you to, instead of you're passing in an employee object, you could pass in a burglar object that inherited from the employee object because you're not using discriminated unions in c sharp because you don't have them. But, but um, <coughs> so you're passing in this thing, you can have a burglar, and it would fall down and do the compare to between the burglar, which is probably a, a security bug here. And that is right in the MSDN docs. It's not now. Someone removed it, but uh, I grabbed it. <laughs> and so here we have our, our, our code. Uh, if our code changes and our docs don't, and our Elixir, we get this lovely thing of a doc test, and then we fail our tests, and we so we fail our build. Concurrency. <coughs> and so here's a picture of me when I was a kid uh, on my first job in 94. Uh, and, and I was just awfully eager to use threads because I thought that would make me a real programmer. <coughs> and, uh, and so, uh, and, and so by the time I bumped into Erlang, I was really, really ready for it because I had learned the lessons of that. And uh, <coughs> so concurrency on the Erlang VM, message passing. We have all these sequential processes that are really easy to think about, and we just pass messages around. Nothing hard about that at all. E super easy to reason about, no thread craziness. And we even, if we have multi-core, we get parallelism. We're able to, all those messages can go at the same time. Error handling. So instead of this land, uh, yeah. yeah. So so this is actually one of the honest things that they do over there in the land of OO, and, and it, it, so at least here when they don't know what to do, they at least bring the machine down in blue screen, and so at least it's honest. So they let it crash in a sense, and so. But you know, I think our let it crash approach is better than that instead of bringing the whole machine down. But uh, so. Uh, let's look at how Elixir air handling looks like. How it looked like uh, Erlang air handling, Elixir air handling during most of my career was this page left intentionally blank because I had not written a try catch ever in production Erlang code. I still haven't. And I <clears throat> the first time I wrote a try catch in Elixir was in 2020. And it was because we had some out external plugins that we were going to be loading into our system. <clears throat> and we didn't want it. To, uh, to cause a process to crash that would be a little bit more expensive. We just expected the errors would be so likely. So let it crash in supervision. We see that. So we get a message that causes us to crash. We just restart. Railway-oriented programming, introduced by Scott Vlashen, talks through this idea of success and failure paths. He links through and shows uh, on the happy path it goes through. On the unhappy path, it goes down here to the error path. And it could have fallen on that first branch. It would have been the same thing. And we see that same thing pulled off, built in in the language in Elixir. It's just beautiful. You know, with our with, we have all our OKs. And if any one of those fall to the wrong track, it goes down to the bottom. <coughs> OK, let's, uh, let's jump in real quick into pattern matching in the bit syntax. This is a fun one, uh, this pokey OK uh, that is built into, that you wouldn't expect, into, uh, into a, a high level language like uh, Elixir or Erlang. So you could look at maybe this. I don't know if this analogy is right or not. But you've got these declarative things on the left, and then you've got this uh, imperative thing on the right. Uh, uh, and then you've got modern C, because they, they didn't like the safety problems that were there, and so they hook up the ground wire. And, uh, okay. But 
Interestingly, you can actually do that low-level stuff in Erlang and Elixir through the bit syntax, and I'll show you this. I think it's super cool. So we have a bit a bitmap, which is going to be this. This is a this is a huge version of. It's a black cell, red, green, blue, and white. And so it's five pixels wide. It's 24-bit color, and here's all the data for the whole thing right there. So let's see what we how we would crack into this in a high-level language uh, that you don't expect this sort of thing out of. So we say, okay, Ben data, we're going to read it. Well, okay, that's not that's that's not great, right? Why do I do with that? <coughs> well, here's what I do with that. I look at it and I say, here's my bin data. And I'm going to say, I'm going to have a pattern match where I'm going to match against the hard string of BM. And then I'm going to throw away 64 bits. And then I'm going to grab 32 bits at that point and store it into offset to pixels. And this is going to be a little Indian uh, int here. And then I'm going to throw away 32 bits, store the width off of the next 32-bit little Indian, height 32-bit little Indian. And then uh, I should then move on. I should have a hard 24 there. And, and then so on. And then we just throw the rest away the binary. And we come in through here and we get this. And it's like, well, OK, did we get anything? <coughs> and so you see this Pokeyoke here. If this is not a bitmap file, we're not going to match that. And so that we, we fall out early. And so we went across, and you can see this capture, capture, capture that I was just describing. Okay? And so we can pull out and we can say, yeah, our pixels begin at 122. We're five pixels wide, one high. And so then we can set up here uh, and store off our pixels to the rest of it after our offset, grab this, and we can do a for loop, basically a list comprehension in red, green, blue. And we've got our picture there on just like one, two, three lines of code, and we've got all of that out of a bitmap, which is, I think, amazing. And I know we're at uh, really close to time now, because I've got, I think, two minutes, and so I'm going to move to the end. And, um, and so um, the final thing here is uh, when I talk to, uh, to um, at conferences to FP conferences and I'm talking to people that are in F sharp or Haskell and so on, they look and they're like, you know, how? How Erlang VM do you get nine nines of uptime? It doesn't make any sense. It's like, how? Uh, you don't even have a type system. <laughs> and so, of course, we have, you know, we have some on the way <laughs> and, you know, Gleam is doing its thing and so, but, but this argument about you don't even have a type system. And the thing is, is what we do have is we have an operating system. And we get all of our good and our safety off of the Erlang VM, which is an operating system that enforces constraints that if you were to go through the stamp book, you're going to have light bulb after light bulb as you're going through this about the things that you use day to day. And as you go through the Pokeoke books, you're going to have these light bulbs. And, and once, you, once you think about this operating system that's protecting you, putting up constraints. And so the Erlang VM doesn't make things just everything easy. What it does is it says, okay, the things that are there will make those easy, but we're going to make a lot of things impossible. And so those constraints of where you can't go off and do the thing, that's where we get our safety from. And so the, magi the machine is doing its work for us there instead of requiring us to do it, which lines up with our, uh, our mantra of separate the human work from machine work, value mistake proofing over diligence, and uh, find and elevate your invariants and constraints. And so um, one thing you could look at is like this uh, karmic um, uh, cycle here. Um, so empathy versus spaghetti is, uh, is your choice. And, and I think we've all made the right choice here. And, um, and so uh, on, your, on your journey with Pokeoke, you know, make it your new sport. And then identify Pokeoke out in the wild. Catalog them in your tool chain catalog your bugs, and build your own Pokeoke -okay to solve those, and then share those with the world. And, uh, and so that is the talk. Uh, thank you. <laughs>